good question. I mean, people have very strong opinions about this issue. Uh, some would say that the whole math wars that we were in, some would say we might still be in, uh, were based around this issue. Based on the evidence that we know, neither the only concepts first or only procedures first is the way to go. That We know that procedural knowledge and conceptual knowledge develop iteratively, that they sort of feed into one another. And so uh, it might be that for certain topics, we might say, well, we should start with the procedure, then go to the concept, and back to the procedure, back to the concept. And for other topics, it's the other way around. Um, it doesn't seem to matter so much where you start as long as we're going back and forth and recognizing that they develop iteratively and they inform each other. So when I learn about a concept, then that informs my subsequent learning of the procedure, which informs my subsequent learning of another concept. And I think that's that's the message we want to say, that it's um, it's not so much that if you only do procedures, then the concepts sort of develop by themselves, or if you only do concepts for a long time, then when you get around one of the procedures are super easy, that we haven't found that to be the case. Uh, there, there are in other countries certain cultural norms that, that come into play here that um, it's not clear how applicable they are to the U.S. context. In some cultures, there is this sense that you practice something a thousand times and then you'll understand it. And it's sort of a sort of Confucian saying that some people say. And, um, and so, I don't know, there might be something there um, that might be built into certain cultures so that's the way learning occurs and that there's a certain amount of reflection when you're practicing a thousand times, it really helps. But the evidence today that we've done in psychological research suggests that they're here. So in the past, say, 50, 100 years ago, there's a sense that we weren't really asking this question at all, that we were just having students demonstrate procedures, and that was the outcome we were interested in, they could do the procedure, and we sort of assumed that they knew what they were doing. And uh, in relatively recent times, there was a push against that, where people said, well, I, I don't think that tells us the whole story, we don't really know what they know, and just by what they do, we need to ask them questions. And so we're, we're kind of in this phase now where many people feel that the way to access student understanding is by getting students to talk and what they say. And so we have this, this link between what students say and what they know. It's the, the verbalization of knowledge has become prioritized. Um, we only know if they really understand if they can explain it. So there is some merit in that. Certainly this sort of maxim that really don't know it until you can teach someone else kind of idea. There's some truth to that, that if I can explain to you really what I was thinking about and what I was going through, then that really does reflect a, a level of understanding. But I guess I would caution from going too far in that direction, that um, people who are at the extreme of that view might argue that no written test that doesn't have a verbalization component can ever truly tap understanding. That, um, for example, some people might say there's no way a multiple choice test can ever tap what understanding is, that understanding is really what's the way by um, asking students questions and probing. And, and I would disagree with that, that it's challenging to design prompts that assess things that we think are understanding, written prompts, like multiple choice tests or free response items. That's, I, I'm not saying that's easy, that's challenging, but it's doable. And that that's what we need to consider. It's really not feasible, if we're interested in understanding, it's not feasible to be able to interview everyone assess understanding, even in my class of 30 or in my school or in the state, that's just not feasible. So maybe we can just be more creative about items that assess understanding. Um, and in the research literature, I think there's a little more movement on that. When you look at a standardized test, even though they might have sections that are labeled conceptual knowledge, some people would question whether they really are assessing conceptual knowledge or whether they're just sort of a different kind of performance. And, and I guess uh, one last thing I'll say about this is from a philosophical point of view, I'm not comfortable separating the knowing from the doing, which is sort of a direction that this sometimes goes. And people say, well, um, how do I know that you really know it? It's because you can talk about it. Um, but in real life, we look at people's performances, what they do, and we can make a judgment about what they know just from what they do. So in the philosophical literature, there's different examples of this. Like, uh, I can look at musicians. So you have a, a, a brilliant musician, and they're playing a piece. Um, 
do you only judge their intelligence or the intelligence of the performance if they can verbalize what they did and break it apart verbally? Or is there something in the performance itself, in the act of doing, you could say, that is an intelligent performance. It represents that they understand by just, just from what they did. Or similarly, for a chef, um, if you have a chef and you, uh, the chef is doing something brilliant that indicates real, real understanding of the way flavors and ingredients fit together and um, build something, then do you depend on their ability to verbalize that and to sort of essentially explain to you what they did uh, to judge their performance as being really superlative or intelligent? Or is it in the act of doing that you really see intelligent performance? And so I, I feel like uh, that I'm hesitant to move in the pure verbalization of real realm because I feel like it separates knowing and doing. And I feel like intelligent performance, intelligent action should be something we are looking for. And we have to design careful prompts and look for it. But that's what we should be looking for. The, the, the cop out answer is that both are important. And that's probably true is that, that we certainly, we've learned a lot in the past. 20 years about the mathematical capacities of very, very young children, and we know that kids could do a lot more at a very young age than we thought they could do. Uh, and so we do seem to have this sort of built-in ability to do certain kinds of math, which is very powerful. What perhaps is missing is our ability to connect school experiences with that intuitive foundation. Uh, so students come in knowing a lot. Uh, can we somehow use what they know and build on it so that they can experience greater success when they are learning school math? Is there a way to kind of leverage intuitive math toward the learning of school math? And I'm not sure that we've completely figured that out yet, although I think that in the elementary school curricula, the, the newer curriculum that have come out in the past 20 years are really trying hard to do that, to, to look at students' strengths and the way that we understand people learn and to try to connect school math with that. Whether or not uh, that helps us understand, say, algebra is a different question because I'm not sure that we have um, intuitive knowledge or sort of preschool knowledge about algebra or algebraic concepts. People might disagree about that, but I'm not so sure. Algebra is abstract and maybe it takes a while before we're comfortable with abstraction. And how do we leverage certain intuitive arithmetic, concrete knowledge about mathematics as we move into more abstract realms like algebra? stuff.